uh... <laughs> This is, uh, this is what I call my, uh, I guess like CSI, you know, NCIS theme song. <laughs> my, uh, my horrible massive attack ripoff or something. <laughs> that's what I've been called track. Yeah, that's just, this is, this is it, huh? This is the vibe. This is, I'm not, well, I mean, it's, it's low in fidelity. Bottom, maybe not. Maybe not the lowest fidelity but yeah <laughs> all right well hi everybody uh it's joshua v hill otherwise known as no clean otherwise known as etc not really i'm not called it etc but like who knows what i will call myself in the future so i'll probably have another i got stuff brewing so we'll see but um i don't know if anybody listened to the new track that's out um and such a fun track to make definitely not crazy out of my comfort zone but definitely a little bit more you know kind of not the typical thing that i would make you know i guess well no i guess it's not true it is it is going in the direction it's softer though not definitely not as hard of a uh of a uh you know definitely not hard sense definitely not really intense definitely not too in your face like a lot of my older tracks kind of can be uh almost to their detriment some of them when i listen to them now but uh but yeah that came out and that did pretty good um and so i was happy about that uh and i'm playing a show this weekend which i'm happy about so I don't, if anybody listening to this is in the albuquerque area there's gonna be a show at the uh, juno brewery um at 6 p.m on saturday the 5th so that's tomorrow um i'll be playing at 7 i think is what i'm gonna be playing uh so yeah come down i'm gonna be doing a cool set it'll be fun jamming out juno's fun um so it's a cool it's a cool vibe so yeah if everybody if anybody in albuquerque here is listening to this then get the hell on down there but if you're not in the albuquerque area uh there's a lot of other things that we got to talk about today um including uh and excluding and re-including what i talked about last week on my slept on segment which was fall 76. Um, I have been playing it for a little while, so it's not like I've actually like recently not been sleeping on it, but I definitely slept on it initially when it came out. Right. So, but I, so I've been through several of the events that they've had, like the different holiday, whatever, uh, big events that they do in the game. And the most recent one that they're doing is this event called evaders invaders from beyond. Right. Um, and it is, for the most part, interest. It's pretty interesting. I like it. I've 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 done it a couple times. Uh, it feels easier than some of the other ones. Sure. I at first I didn't really like the aliens. I was kind of ticked off by the aliens. It felt uh, almost kind of like they were too bullet bullet spongy a little bit. Um, and that kind of ticked me off a little bit. But then I not found out was kind of looking up and people were talking about it in the subreddit that I guess in the most recent update, a lot of people have been feeling like Vats got fucked up. I feel like Vats got fucked up. Uh, I, I feel like now I'm missing um, uh, criticals, which is, I, I mean, I don't know. It, part of me feels like that makes sense because it says 95%, but a part of me is like, it's a critical so shouldn't we be able to hit it? It's like, why are you nerfing this thing? But I mean, you know, once you get Gun Fu, once you get Green Pepper Sprint, once you get a couple of those perk cards going on a good rifle build, you know, semi or not, you could start picking, you can just blah, 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 and your, you know, AP keeps recharging, you go forever. Uh, so I, I guess in a sense, I understand why they nerfed that. But so initially when I was fighting the aliens, right, I was kind of running into this problem. Where I was like, okay, shoot and shoot and I would do critical. I had like a couple criticals in a row, not hit at all i was like um what is going on here uh and it was against those big ass fucking like the aliens in the suits whatever those are called um alien invaders i'm guessing is what those are called yeah because they have the drones the invaders and the regular ones and then the flatwood monster which i love how they kind of incorporated that in because i felt like honestly out of all of the different um cryptids that they have in fallout 76 i would probably say that the flatwoods is the one that i've ran into the least 
out of any of them, probably. I'm trying to think. Um, well, I, get, I mean, the thing is with like Mothman, I've ran into Mothman, but doing like the Enlightenment quest, which really isn't, it's, you, you, you know, you don't fight the Mothman, it grants you powers, you know, and it flies away or whatever. I don't actually don't even think it flies away. It just like sits there until you leave. Um, but so that one, I guess, but beyond that, um, I think, you know, Flatwood was probably one of the cryptids I hadn't seen a lot. So it's cool that they're including it within the whole invaders, you know, from beyond, you know, event that happens. Plus, I love how it changes kind of the visuals, the storm that it adds. Um, I haven't seen in my game uh, a mothership, but there is supposedly one, or at least I'm seeing it on because I'm on the wiki right now and they have a picture of a mothership, but I have not seen one in game. So that would be cool if there was one, but I don't know. I mean, it might be similar to like the nukes because you don't see the nuke explosion. It just creates the zone once you launch it. Right. So, you know, who knows? But so far, this has been good. I'm getting towards the tail end of uh, some of the content that I got to finish in that game. And then once that happens, unless they add more, uh, I might be done. You know, I might be out. I might not get Fallout first again. I'm trying to I think my uh, things up in June. So I'm trying to get everything going before then. But you know, um, I gotta say like 76, you know, there are a lot of things that I do not like about it. Uh, I feel like there's arbitrary gates that they put around you, like kind of the fact that you can only get like 1200 caps a day. The fact that you can only get like 300 legendary scripts a day. The fact that the vault, I think it's the vault metal or the vault module or whatever is tied to the dailies, which that's not as bad as the other two. That makes sense. But the other two are just stupid because the idea is like, oh, we don't want to like fuck up the economy by having all these people have caps. And you're like, yeah, but like, I don't know. Like when I hear about people talking about the legacy weaponry that just wrecks everything, it's like, well, why do you care about the economy if people have these weapons that are so expensive? It's so ridiculous. Like who cares about the, like, why are you fretting over this so much? Just let people like, or at least increase the maximum to like 10,000 caps. But I feel like even then it's still not like a ridiculous amount. Like just, you know, push it up. You know, it's it's a problem that's been in a lot of Bethesda games. That I remember when I first started modding uh, New Vegas. Uh, when I think, was it New Vegas was the first one I modded? Or it might have been Fallout 3. One of the two. When I first started modding those games, I think one of the early ones that I got was the increased vendor caps capacity thing. Because I just, you just get tired of going selling all your stuff and then if you can't sell it all and you still have some stuff you're trying to get rid of okay now i gotta wait like three days like 72 hours in game which you know doesn't take long it takes like a minute and a half maybe or two minutes to like cycle through all those days or whatever but like it's just kind of like ease of use in a video game and i just kind of wish that they would just let you have caps it was just like an infinite reserve you could pull from I also, even though I understand, I guess, on a server level, why they don't have you let you have infinite storage space, I kind of wish they did. I also kind of wish that you had separate storage spaces so that you could actually store your items in different boxes. Again, I understand why they didn't do that exactly, uh, because pretty much everything else respawns in the entire game except for specific items that connect to specific stuff connected to your character so in a sense i could see simplifying that on the back end kind of why they want to do that but just ease of use wise you know it just kind of kills me <clears throat> excuse me but you know speaking of new vegas uh they i guess have been there have been rumblings about a new vegas 2 at microsoft now this was happening this has been happening since Microsoft bought Obsidian. And I remember, because when, let's look up, when did Microsoft buy Obsidian? 2018, right, yeah. So that was when they, I think that might have been even before Minecraft. Let's see. Minecraft, Minecraft. Oh, no. Wow, that was way long time ago. What am I talking about? Okay, but you know, before they kind of went on this recent spree, I guess you could say that you know they acquired Obsidian a while ago, and uh, uh, the outer uh, what do you call it? The uh, the game that they, the Outer Wilds, or no, the Outer Wild, right? Because Wilds was uh, Wilds was that other game where it's like the puzzle game with the solar system, I think, and Wild. 
right? I don't know. Both those games had similar names. It came out at similar times. It kind of fucked me up. But anyways, they had that game. That was one of the early games that they released, Game Pass and everything. And that was one of the uh, Microsoft buyouts. And Obsidian also, of course, happens to be, you know, the creators of New Vegas. Not only that, but like some of the original people that were the creators of Fallout that came from, I think, what is Van Buren or one of the older, uh, one of the older, uh, game studios that created the fallout series including the creator of fallout who is still i think working at obsidian um you know and so ever since microsoft bought them there's kind of been rumblings that like oh well i mean technically well and it wasn't even this it was okay microsoft bought them in 2018 but it was really when bethesda when they acquired Bethesda and that's when everybody was like, Oh, uh, is there going to be rumblings when, uh, you know, is there going to be stuff going down? Like, could we, cause now technically Microsoft owns both the fallout IP and obsidian. And now obsidian doesn't have to go necessarily through Bethesda to have access to that IP. Now I guess they do cause Bethesda owns the IP and they're owned by Microsoft, but I'm guessing what this does is it makes it a little bit easier. It kind of contains it. It kind of, uh, you know, just makes it an easier thing to kind of like do, you know, uh, and maybe, you know, greases kind of wheels a little bit. Uh, I, but then I don't know, I go back and forth. I heard, I've heard rumors that obsidian had a rough time dealing with Bethesda when they made new Vegas. Now, I don't know if that's true. Um, exactly. But I just, I always remember hearing rumors about that. So I don't know if, you know, now times have changed, maybe it'll be different. But there's theories going around that because Microsoft owns both of these studios now, that there are talks of New Vegas, very early talks, but at least talks of a New Vegas too, which would be interesting because the original New Vegas was amazing. Um, And initially, I remember not necessarily liking New Vegas as much as Fallout 3, whereas now... I don't know. I, it's, a, it's a hard one because as I've gone back, I went back and played Fallout 4 even. And I like Fallout 4 a lot more now than I did when I originally played it. When I originally played it, I was over it. I was like, fuck this game. Well, I wasn't like, fuck this game, but there's a lot of problems with it. There's performance problems that kind of got me down. And there's certain things I was hoping for that being transferred over from Skyrim that I think didn't get. And stuff like that, that kind of, you know, changed my view of it. Um, but then, you know, left alone for years and then came back and played it recently and loved it a lot more than I did originally. And the same thing happened to me with New Vegas. And so I can only imagine what a New Vegas 2 would be, especially if they're given a little bit more comp block or carte blanche to do whatever. Uh, and maybe even with the modern uh, Bethesda engine or with their engine that they used on Outer Wild. I don't know how that would work or what Bethesda would require them to do, you know, but who knows because maybe they get a crack on it with their own engine and they get to make maybe like a heavily more story based instead of like rpg action based game you know than bethesda i don't know uh it's very interesting uh i would be very interested to see where they go with it um and just what happens uh i guess i think uh what was that well it's jeff grubb which everybody loves jeff grubb is reporting on it um and it seems like they're saying that there's a lot of interest Microsoft in and throughout Microsoft for trying to get New Vegas 2 to happen. And I get it. I mean, now everybody credits New Vegas 2 for being better, like the better, like an actual RPG, which I do agree. It When I originally played it, because of how they restrict the perks and how everything happens, um, you do kind of go through this. Uh, it does kind of like clamp like you down into like you have to pick like you can't be me you can't be melee and gun you have to pick melee or guns or unarmed or heavy guns or you're gonna have to specialize um and i like that that was a cool situation a uh, cool thing to do that you didn't really get in fault through just because of how they kind of had it set up you were you kind of became a jack of all trades really um um and that's kind of what happens in a lot of bethesda games they made it make a little bit more sense and Skyrim, especially eventually after they released DLC, just because you could technically level up your character forever. And so then you could uh, theoretically get all of the perks in the game, but it's just going to take you a while. And that's what they also did with Fallout 4, which is great because then the gating is, well, how long are you going to play? You know, you play through this game, you might get to level 100, but to get all the perks, you're going to have to get to level like three or 400. Do you want to play this game for that long? Or if you don't, then you've got to focus your character a little bit more at the beginning. Um, I kind of like that. It kind of gives you best of both worlds. So then even when you do focus your character and you want to keep playing the game, now you can kind of expand out 
and try out some of the other systems in the game. So I kind of like that stuff. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens with New Vegas 2. I'm very interested in New Vegas 2. I've been very interested in a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, hearkening back to... I'm not usually that kind of person. I hate... Uh, I hate a lot of the sequel sequelitis that's been happening recently in our pop culture. But with certain things, um, it's been enough time. And I feel like New Vegas, it's been enough time, you know. Uh, and so I think you can give things kind of once it's been enough time, give it a little break. You can let it go. You can kind of do it. Um, and, you know, we can relive these games, these older games through different means. Like recently, I've been playing TDW, which if you don't know, is Tale Between the Two Wastes. And basically what it is, it's a mod because Fallout 3 and New Vegas were on the same game engine, basically. It, they they use similar a lot of the similar files. What this mod does is it kind of cleans up a lot of those conflicts and combines those two games together so that you can play both Fallout 3 and New Vegas together. Like they happen, even though in the grand scheme of the world, they happen in the same world, you can literally travel between the wastelands, right? Uh, and you can even like start in Fallout 3 when you're born as a baby so that you don't, so that the storyline makes sense. Or you can start in New Vegas and then you just travel to the wasteland. And there's even like a cool like subway train thing that they have that you have to pay like, I think it's like three or 500 caps to go back and forth between the wasteland. But I mean, eventually you find other ways to go back and forth between the wastelands. Plus there's tons of mods that you can install that allow you to go back and forth and do all kinds of stuff. And so it's a really cool way to play both fallout three and new Vegas again, and kind of relive, relive it, especially if those two games are like, if you really like those games originally when they came out, just because now you can bring weapons over and it's all built on the new Vegas engine, which in my opinion, or the new Vegas version of Fallout, uh, of that Fallout engine, which in my opinion was better. And so it kind of helps with a lot of the problems that you run into in Fallout 3. But anyways, like I've been playing TTW. I've been seeing people talk about um, uh, the new Vegas in the Fallout 4 engine. They're trying to completely, and a lot of people have been doing this. Uh, they do this with Bethesda games where every single new game engine, they basically try to recreate the games from the previous game engine in the new game engine. And it's been like fan projects that have done this. Uh, and the most recent ones that I've been getting into is there's the New Vegas that's coming out in the Fallout 4 engine. I don't forgot what they call what they're calling that, but they've been slowly kind of trickling out mods for it and uh, some of the areas and stuff kind of slowly. Um, and that one looks interesting because uh, I would definitely play it, though. You know, after playing TTW, man, it's hard to go back to anything that's just like pure Fallout 4 or Fallout 3 or New Vegas, just because the crosstalk between those two games is really cool. Um, and uh, so it's really hard to kind of go back at this point. Um, but another one of the crazy ones that I've been seeing recently is uh, Sky Oblivion, which is them, which is this group that is trying to take... Uh, is basically recreating Oblivion in the Skyrim engine and then also updating a lot of the stuff like, you know, if you go back and you play Oblivion, um, the way that the leveling up system works, you can kind of like level yourself up into uh, into the ground, uh, for lack of a better term. You can kind of make it so that your character isn't as powerful in the later game. And then you're leveling up stuff that you should have leveled up before in the later game. And you're basically screwed. You have to like restart your character or just suffer. Um, <laughs> and so it wasn't the best level up system. So I'm excited to see what they do to change that and kind of adapt it for the Skyrim system. But I've been watching a lot of their, de uh, their like dev diaries and stuff that they've been doing. And man, have they not taken what was already a gorgeous engine and even playing like 76, Bethesda's kind of like taken that engine to kind of like new levels. But man, is Sky Oblivion just like is beyond gorgeous. Like some of the stuff that they've done, uh, I think in one of the last dev diaries, they finally showed the Oblivion in a realm which was gorgeous it was great um it's gonna be exciting to have that kind of stuff happen again um and even they're doing crazy stuff like uh i guess in the original uh, in, uh incarnation of some of the cities or at least one of the cities leowin specifically um one of the incarnations in the uh uh what do you call it the uh concept art when they were originally designing the game was to kind of have the city broken into like several sections and kind of have these like dock canal like things running through them. I don't know what the I think there's an actual specific term for it. It's these kind of like dock canals in between castles and stuff. I don't know. But they basically 
uh, had that kind of vision for it. And I guess the devs of this remake fell in love with that vision of Leowin. So they basically rebuilt that entire city as a completely different version of that city that is more akin to the original concept art from um, from Oblivion. And so it's just, uh, it's just kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. It's super interesting. I really want to play it because I've been kind of itching to play Oblivion again. I don't know why. I, I kind of... There was parts of Oblivion that I kind of liked a lot more than Skyrim and kind of what they did with the world and the quest and stuff. Uh, and just the gates, how kind of... Even though they weren't necessarily random, or were they random, the Oblivion gates? I don't think they were random, but it was just cool because you kind of stumbled upon them a lot of the time. Um, and it was also my first uh, Elder Scrolls game, so I think that why, that's why it has a special place in my heart. So I'm really excited for that. I don't think they have a release date on it, um, but it's definitely one of those things that I'm like keeping an eye out for just because it's going to be crazy when it finally comes out. Um, and just what they've been doing to some of the stuff, like when, they, when they've been showing, because in some of the dev diary uh, things that they have, they've been showing some of the armor sets and stuff. And like, man, you thought like stuff couldn't get more gorgeous than what was in like Skyrim and stuff. It's, it was, it's impressive what they're doing with this game engine. Uh, and I'm, I th I, don't, I don't know. I know that Bethesda knows about it because they've talked a couple times about, I guess, during some of their live streams, Bethesda devs being in like the chat and stuff, talking about stuff. And so I don't know if they have a blessing or whatever, but it's, it's cool that at least this isn't even shut down. I hope it doesn't get shut down. I hope it gets gone through and, you know, we get to play oblivion in El in, in the skyrim engine which is crazy um you know this is just this this feels like well i don't even know if this feels like this is going to be a uh it's just going to be exciting to uh finally you know play that game in like a kind of crazy revamped way kind of what they've been showing but it's just, it's it's very interesting um and then i don't know if i've mentioned this uh to anybody uh, on this podcast yet i'm not sure but if you did not know i am a big 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 pokemon fan um big 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 pokemon fan uh hold up i gotta here i gotta ooh, 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 okay you probably heard a whole bunch of uh scratching or whatever that was me that was the mic almost falling over just like <laughs> i had to get that going but anyways i'm a big pokemon fan been a big pokemon fan forever recently i kind of fell off uh i haven't played i don't have a switch so i haven't played any of the new pokemon games i haven't played like rcs well i guess i talked about rcs when it came out so i probably done this but just rehash haven't played any of the new art uh new games right um i think this last week they just announced pokemon scarlet and violet which is like holy shit um uh, I thought I was going to be pumped for Arceus, but now, cause literally the first thing I thought when I saw Arceus, when I saw people playing, it, I was just like, okay, this is an interesting game. And then once I started seeing people play it more, and then I understood like the whole like game mechanic behind the alphas, I kind of started to get like where they were going with the game overall and like what the whole point of the game was. Um, and, uh, like, and it seemed like, you know, and kind of, you, you kind of get the vibe from it, especially when you go through the Pokedex, uh, as I've seen people go through the Pokedex that, you know, they want you to catch Pokemon. The, the main motivation of that game is to catch Pokemon, is to fill out the Pokedex, which is interesting for a Pokemon game because usually the main motivation, well, that's the initial motivation, but the other motivation is, yo, bro, go get the fucking badges, go hit the Elite Four. They changed that up in Sun and Moon, of course, which is interesting and fun. Um, I don't... I think they went back to gyms and sons, you know, uh, sword and shield sons and sons. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they announced fucking Pokemon Scarlet and Violet and man, uh, I, like I said, the first thing when I started seeing people play Arceus was, okay, it's cool that they're doing this Pokemon thing. Like this catch, you're, you're catching the Pokemon primarily kind of focusing on that in the game. But I did kind of start to feel like, oh, so there's no trainer battles. And then when I heard people were like, oh yeah, there's barely any. Uh, I was kind of like, well, that's kind of a crazy concept to barely have any trainer battles. And I thought it kind of on top of kind of how the graphics looked and several other things, it kind of made it seem like the game was lacking, uh, in, in a way. Uh, and I could definitely see how people getting later late game in that game kind of get to a point where you're just like, okay, well, I'm just kept catching the same Pokemon. I got to do this, do that. It's like, who cares? You know, you're like, there's no end, you know, there's nothing else to do. Now, I don't know if there's an actual end game in Arceus or what the whole deal with that is, but my first thought was like, oh man, if they could just figure out a way, not figure out a way, but if they just adapted the Arceus model of like open world, 
but not even open world. Because I mean, like if you look at well, and even Gold, Pokemon Gold for a perfect, uh, uh, perfect example of this is pseudo open world when you hit a certain point, because you can kind of go to multiple towns when you hit a certain point. Um, and so all they'd have to do is do that same kind of thing. And then maybe even maybe they have a little bit of gating, but they just be like, no, 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 you go out as far as you can into the world. And if you start running into trainers that have significantly higher Pokemon than you, then you better, you know, hightail it back. And they could do it the same way where you have towns in between other towns with routes in between them. And then, you know, all the Pokemon in the town maybe don't battle you, but all the Pokemon out in the routes will battle you. Stuff like that. I was like, see, if they took some of these Arceus elements and threw them into a main, you know, main Pokemon game. It'd be great. Then see the reveal trailer for Scarlet and Violet. And from everything, it looks like they're going for that. They're going to really go for open world. And it's great that they did because I think, you know, Arceus is basically selling better than any of the previous fucking Pokemon games. Uh, almost. I think it all pretty much got up the list. I think it got close to or beat out gold, which was the one that I think sold the most um in total i think or was number two it was one of the it was up there on the list and it got up there being a single game without you know either versions and so violet and scarlet being two games one and then also taking all the things from rcs the only thing that i could see with this game is maybe it cannibalizing some of the pokemon uh cannibalizing you know because it's so close to rcs but at the same time they do release games yearly um so i could kind of see it not necessarily being as bad. Uh, and, you know, the graphics, again, don't look the most spectacular, but they definitely look better than Arceus. And we'll see what they do with the world. If the world has good, you know, kind of world design, kind of make up make up for it, you know, with the graphics department. And, you know, I feel like indie games in this recent time period have kind of showed that you can make up for a lot of shortcomings when it comes to graphics uh, with world design. And that's why, like, games, uh, like some of my favorites, like Metroid Prime, um, uh, you know, now when you play them, they're gorgeous, uh, just because of how they designed those worlds, you know, they're very interesting looking. Uh, I feel like Halo is kind of another one of those though. When you go back and play the original Halo, it definitely shows its age. Whereas like go back and play Metroid and it only shows its age. If you don't play it in HD, when you play it in HD, you're like, wow, this game actually does look really like some of the enemies and some of the stuff, but like a lot of the world's very involved. Uh, and so I hope that that's what they do with this Pokemon game. We'll see what happens. I, I'm definitely going to have to get a Switch before the end of this year because I haven't been this excited for Pokemon in forever. I really kind of got over it. Shield, uh, Short and Shield kind of made, you know, I was kind of over it. Uh, I, I got, uh, I, that's why I didn't even buy a Switch because I was kind of semi disappointed by that game just visually when I first saw it. And I, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk good things about it, but I was like, man, it's just kind of a bummer that the first Pokemon console game wasn't like this game you know it wasn't something like more revolutionary that was my problem is it just kind of looked like and seemed like you know x and y2 you know which wasn't what i was expecting for we're actually now going to a full-fledged console uh this should be a step up and so this rcs stuff we'll see where that goes that seems like it'll be a step up uh the the way that that gameplay goes and hopefully they kind of like update it iterate on it with scarlet and violet and make it more interesting, give us more interesting Pokemon, you know, and I hope the game looks better. They haven't really released anything except for, I know they have the three starters, uh, which are great. I don't, so I originally hated the fire starter and the water starter. Uh, what is it? Fukoko and Quaxley. They don't, I was like, ah, I was like, they look cheesy, bro. And everybody making comparisons from Fukoko to fucking uh, Totodile, you're out of your goddamn mind, okay? Like, yes, I'll give you Fukoko's cute. Or how the fuck you say that? Is it Fukoko? I'm guessing it's Fukoko. It's cute, right? Totodile, even in its baby form, is cute. But that motherfucker looks like it's going to fucking rip your arm off still, okay? Even in. It's baby form. And that's what the old school Pokemon have that I feel like some of the new school designs lack is some of the new school designs are a little bit too kind of like almost chibi, a little bit too friendly constantly. Whereas like some of the old school Pokemon designs are like, it, it's like when you like when you're when you look at your grandpa wrong and they give you that fucking look. It's like that old school, like, don't mess with me look. Uh, and a lot of the old school Pokemon kind of have that. And so people comparing them 
Because originally, I didn't even think that the Fukoko thing was a fucking alligator. I thought it was like a duck or some other kind of thing when I originally saw it. And everybody being like, oh, no, it's an alligator. I'm like, well, thank God, because then hopefully its evolved form will be something interesting. You know, for an alligator, an alligator uh, fi fire type could be cool. Because that could be, and this is what I hope they do with some of these, especially the uh, third evolutions of these starters, is give me some cool types, man. Like, I wanted a ghost starter for a grip man like let's do it let's you know with the fire let's do water fire let's do something interesting with some of these starters i don't care if it messes up the dynamics i don't give a fuck like just at this point we have like a thousand fucking pokemon who cares what you do with the goddamn dynamics just add new pokemon add cool powers kind of push the meta you know i mean you, you know we can't have like because everybody's like this excuse of like oh man you know like this is a thousand pokemon how do you expect them to balance a game like that and you're like have you ever heard of a game called Magic the Gathering or like d and Well, d and is probably a little bit less so, but like Magic the Gathering or like any of these old school card games that have been going around forever. Imagine how many cards they have in those. And yes, there are a lot of those cards that are banned in a lot of different tournaments and they have certain things that kind of, you know, that are around that. But I mean, like they handle it. They balance the game. They still go forward. They're not like, oh, man, you know, we made oh, we hit 30,000 cards. We're done. I mean, they've they've had to have created 30,000 cards. I mean, what they released like a new set, like three new sets a year, I think, if not more or every quarter. I don't know. I think they I think they released like at least three or four sets every single year. I'm not as I'm not a big magic person, but I'm just saying that's a game where they have to balance it. And it's a massive amount of moving parts. You can do it in a fucking video game. OK, like. And man, did they fucking do Quaxley dirty. He's like a, he's like a, he's like a Don Jr., bro. He's just like, just done dirty. And I hope they just do the water types dirty, man. There haven't been, you know, there's, they do them dirty until they're not done dirty. And then like, there's like some of, like, there's a few of them that are just really badass and the rest of them done dirty it's just like fire types they do they did the fucking fire type starters dirty they you know just these constant firefighting types and we're like we don't need another goddamn like primate knockoff with fire okay we don't need it bro um and so man that would always tick me off uh and so it's just it's and, and so the out of these three initially seeing them i and i'm not i'm not usually the grass type starter person but i like the what is that uh Spagatito, spaghetto, spagatito, spagotito, spaghetto, spagatito, spaghetti. He's spaghetti cat, I, bro. I'm gonna tell you what. I probably should have watched a video on how to pronounce that beforehand. But I'm gonna tell you what. What the fuck is up with that name? Why, why can't we go back to like a Bulbasaur style kind of thing? What the fuck is this supposed to be? And then people are gonna be like, well, actually, Josh, a spagato is a type of vine. And that's what this cat is based on. It's based on a vine. I'm like, I don't give a fuck if it's based on a vine. Make it make more sense to me when I read it. Okay, I'll figure out how to say that ever well, later. But that's probably gonna be my starter. I'm probably gonna pick the grass type unless the grass types final form is horrid looking. Um, we'll see. I usually pick the starter based on the coolest looking one. I don't care about types. I don't care. Cause like, you know, if I cared about types, my original, uh, starter was Fraligator was, you know, Totodile. But if you're talking about my favorite starter, like family of all time is Charmander, Charmeleon, Charizard. Like that's the best and X and Y giga, whatever the fuck forms. That's the coolest. A starter family in my opinion um the best one and i think still though it is closely t i don't know the f first three generations are tied neck and neck for like cool starters because those three have really really good starters um i'm trying to remember uh the other starters uh I'd have to go look through them because I remember them visually, but I have to go like because they all kind of, you know, it's just it's so much fucking Pokemon. It's all kind of flying around in my head, at, you know, 300 miles an hour. Um, yeah. So, you know, it is what it is. But I mean, we'll see. We'll see. I'm excited. I'm excited. New Pokemon. I'm going to have to break out my collection because I had I had a living Pokedex all the way up to like 800 in some odd what well, at the end of sun and moon i had all i had all the pokemon up to the end of sun and moon before i stopped playing so i don't have the sword and shield pokemon so i guess i'm gonna have to catch all those fuckers um <laughs> and whatever else you know see hopefully rcs will help me i don't know we'll see uh but yeah that's you know that's pokemon that's you know pokemon pokemon is pokemon um 
Yeah. And speaking of, I, you know what? The, we, and I was talking to my mom about this because when we saw this, uh, what a, such a good movie, but Detective Pikachu, they really need to make, I don't, they don't need to make another Detective Pikachu. They don't need to make another Detective Pikachu, but what they really need to do is they need to make another Pokemon movie with that level of fidelity, bro. Like the Pokemon in that movie were gorgeous. I want more live action Pokemon movies, whatever the storyline, whatever. I mean, Detective Pikachu was also so cute just because of the Ryan Reynolds connection and all that stuff. But like, man, they really need to figure out how to like do that again. Cause I, I just cannot, it was just so gorgeous. You know, I was just, I, and we were talking about, they really need to hit that, get that going. The other thing that we were talking about recently, which I don't know, um, I don't know how I feel is the blade reboot being PG 13. Um, so I just recently rewatched Blade. Uh, I had rewatched it because this last October, me and my girlfriend went to uh, Denver and they have a, or they had, and I don't know if this is a year round bar. I think it might be, it might not be, I'm not sure, but it was Halloween time when we went um, and there was a slasher bar and it was, I think it was called slasher. Uh, and they were, you go in, you know, all this kind of slasher horror movie, you know, paraphernalia and everything. And then they had TVs everywhere. And instead of playing like sports or something, they were playing horror movies. It's great. Such a cool little spot. But they were playing Blade when we went. Um, and that like triggered like, oh, man, we should rewatch this movie or I should rewatch this movie. And I don't think my girlfriend had seen it. Um, and so we rewatched it. It was awesome. You know, so great. Just very much in that style of that era, that Matrix kind of like, you know, leather and, you know, uh, uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon kind of like fighting. Um, not, you know, of course, Blade doesn't go like, you know, we're walking on walls, jumping all over the place. It doesn't go quite that far. But I mean, because of the vampire thing, they can kind of, you know, work with that. But, you know, so I recently rewatched it and, you know, rewatching that movie Cause that movie, I'm pretty positive the original Blade uh, was rated R, right? I'm pretty positive it was. Let's see, what was it rated? What was it rated? What was it rated? What was it rated? Let's see, original Blade. Where you know the internet. Oh, yeah. Okay, they were rated R. Yeah. So, that's what I thought. You know, well, the amount of blood, I guess I should have guessed. But <laughs> but I just, I sit here and I look at Disney with the MCU being like, oh, Blade reboot PG-13. And you're like, why though? Like, the original Blade was R and it was fine. And like, made a decent amount of money. Like, what did the original Blade make? Let's see here. Okay, box office was $131 million, okay? And that's that's back in fucking... Oh, shit, I think. Oh, that fell down. Okay, I was like, what the hell? I was like, there's somebody in my house! And <laughs> there's nobody in my house. Um, but, yeah, that's 1998 money, right? And that's, like, not, like, blow it out of the world, but, like, you know, that's pretty decent, right? That's not... The, to me, 131 million is not something of like, oh man, we gotta make this PG-13 so we can make more money. So like them trying to make it PG-13, I do not understand. Like they could make it work. It's vampires, you know. You kill them, they blow up into dust. Not as much blood, but I, you know, especially it being a vampire thing and having to deal with blood, and especially like that first scene in the club where blood comes out of the sprinklers, even though it is so kind of cheesy in a way, and like even describing it is kind of like. Man, but like visually that scene is very striking and very intense and such a cool action scene and a start to the movie in anything. And so the fact that they're going to make Blade PG-13, especially with like this person was making the comparison that, you know, like Deadpool 3 is going to be rated R and it's going to be the only rated R movie in the MCU. But like if if Deadpool could be rated R and do the things that it did, which I think didn't it break records too, or, you know, it did enough where it's, we're on the third goddamn one, you know. I don't understand this want to kind of dumb down and cut down a lot of this content, especially when the audience has expressed it wanting the content to be as graphic as the con, especially the original content is, you know, and that's the one thing that I don't understand is why you would kind of soften the punch of con of a piece of content that doesn't need to be 
you know, you're not, you're not changing the audience. You know, this isn't the Blade cartoon where maybe it's understandable that you want to kind of like take a lot of the violent, like taper the violence down a little bit, even though hell like anime is a massive genre and that has tons of violence that's not tapered down and even in certain circumstances taken to such a ridiculous extreme it's it's nonsensical but you know this whole idea of like taking things down uh it's i just i just don't understand it and you know it just it kind of boggles my mind i just don't understand the 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 uh the whatever you call it the uh the want to kind of go there, you know, with that kind of thing. To me, it just doesn't make any sense, you know. It's just, you know, whatever. But, uh, and I was looking, you know, there's some movies, like, there's Lightyear, um, and there's, I guess, the new Jurassic World. But I was looking through some of these movies that are coming out this year, and I'm like, what's what do we have? What's It isn't, you know, I know we're kind of slowly, you know, trudging back to normalcy when it comes to, like, you know, getting past COVID and everything, but... It's just, it's kind of mind boggling. And then like another one that had jumped out at me that I completely forgot about is the Chippendale Rescue Rangers, which I get that they're originally called Chippendale, but you, I mean, are Chip, is the Chippendale dancers not popular anymore? I guess not. So you kind of get away from that, uh, <laughs> get away from that association. But, and then Hocus Pocus 2, which is great. But again, you know, we're kind of going into like the billionth, uh, F and sequel territory again and Hocus Pocus is such a special thing that they could really a special thing to me especially because that was like one of my Halloween movies when I was a kid growing up they could really fuck that up and man if you really fuck that kind of thing up we'll see, I mean we'll see you know I gotta get it back out there and start seeing movies again I didn't I didn't see Jackass forever when it was in theaters and I kind of wanted to see that one but you know, it is what it is. Another crazy thing. Now, this is a little bit of a deviation. This is this is in the music world. But a crazy thing that happened recently that I saw was that Bandcamp got sold to Epic Games. Now, uh, a lot of people, rightly so, I think, are kind of freaking out about this because I think before this point, Bandcamp was completely independent which fit with its ethos, the whole independent ethos and everything that it was trying to do. Um, and so, you know, like, it's a hard one because, you you know, I, I think about it in a whole bunch of different aspects. You know, I think about it as like the ethos. And if I was running something that had that ethos, I would think that I would probably stick to that ethos until I died. So it would stay that way until I died. And then if people bought it and changed it after then, I couldn't help that. Um, but then another part of me thinks, well, if I did create something like Bandcamp and the opportunity came up to make a whole bunch of money and basically like early retirement myself or whatever, why wouldn't I do that? And then the guy is going to continue to want the guy that the owner, you know, or the, the guy that runs it and the owner of it. Uh, he said he's going to continue to run it. So, you know, Part of me understands the want as the creator to do this, but then, yeah, it's, and then it's also weird because it's Epic Games. It's like, what is Epic going to do with it besides just own it? Do they just want it to make money? And then if that's the case, that's not good. Are they taking it to try to use some kind of, do some kind of music integration? Do they want to take Bandcamp and use that to compete with like a Spotify maybe? Which would be interesting on the indie side of things to be like, we're an indie Spotify. Because I mean, I think Bandcamp already does that. They have the Bandcamp app and you can stream every single release I think you buy or at least the releases that the artists allow you to do. You can stream them from the app. So they already kind of have a foundation here that they could kind of start bending into a more mainstream you know thing well mainstream but not mainstream i think there is kind of like a want out there especially in the music culture for uh an underground scene and if you are able to make an app that is the underground this is your underground streaming service right that would be kind of an interesting thing and i think you could probably get a lot of people to do that plus you could probably get a lot of artists to want to go that especially go to that service especially if you paid them better and Especially if you just kind of kept it how Bandcamp is, where it's pretty easy peasy lemon squeezy. I don't have to go through a distro. I don't have to do any of that. I can just upload it myself. Bing, bang, boom. You know, set 
everything how I can set it, bing, bang, boom. But it depends, you know, if they start putting more infrastructure in, are they going to start locking this down more? Is it going to start taking things away from the artist? According to the uh, CEO, um, he said they're going to keep doing the, I think the Fridays, the, the monthly Bandcamp Fridays events that they've been doing. They're going to try to keep it or they're going to keep it, uh, um, you know, an artist first kind of situation, but you know, you can only do that so far. And the thing is, is I don't know, I think they outright bought them. So, you know, it's going to be a hard one because, you know, hopefully in according to some things I've heard with Epic there, this is also a hands off kind of buy for them as well. They kind of want to just buy it and see where it goes. But I could see, you know, Bandcamp kind of being pushed into, like I said, a more indie Spotify. And that could be interesting, even though, you know, I don't want to go down this road with the music industry of now you have to pay for five different fucking services to get all the music that you want. Um, but I would appreciate a competitor to Spotify that could give artists including people like me, more money for our streams. And I have friends, uh, artist friends that I know that are making a decent amount of money on Bandcamp a month. So, and I haven't talked to them about it. It'd be interesting to hear what their opinions are about it and see where they would go with it. But, uh, but yeah, you know, and sorry if uh, you probably been hearing this. I don't know. I'm, Okay, so it's kind of picking up on the mic. I was, I was trying to see if it was picking up on the mic. You can probably hear it is a windstorm. It is a tornado of massive... I'm kidding. There's no tornado, but it's pretty fucking windy out there. Albuquerque every once in a while gets kind of windy. So if you've been hearing crazy shenanigans outside, that's probably what that's from. Um, and then I think the last but not... Well, oh, last but not least, before last but not least, is I listened to Donda number dose so i listened to donda 2 and i didn't i don't have a stem player didn't buy one so i just found it on youtube i think somebody had posted it or yeah i think it was youtube or I, it wasn't i didn't find it directly off youtube i found a link a video link that somebody had posted on reddit and kind of went through there and i'm pretty positive somebody was hosting it on youtube um before because i imagine they've probably been taking those down this was like right this was like the fucking day or like even like hours after he had like put it out so it was like really close in that time period oh shit slurpy slurp um anyways i listened to it i will say i like it better than donda i it still has the problem of being a little bit too um, kind of self-indulgent, but I don't feel like it's quite as bad as the original Donda, uh, the original Donda, the first Donda. It's not as bad as the first Donda album when it comes to the self-indulgent part, but the problem with this album, and it kind of went in an odd direction initially from all of the social media posts, like, you know, you look at all the shit that's been going on with the Kim and Kanye divorce situation, the Pete Davidson and all that stuff. And you're like, this is kind of like a fucked up, like rich guy basically being a stalker kind of situation, right? Like you're like, this shit's getting kind of crazy, like kind of creepy and kind of ridiculous. And then even like recently, he released the music video to Easy, which supposedly, I didn't watch it, but people were supposedly saying that he like buries a body in it or kills somebody and buries it. And it kind of seems like and it's all claymation, but it looks like it's Pete. Uh, uh, and so you're like, you're like, what is this? What is this situation? Um, and initially beforehand, just because of some of the, like some of the tweets that Kanye had been making, you, uh, it seemed like, oh, this is just going to be like lame dad divorce shit. Right. And so that's kind of what I expected from the album. And then you listen to the album and two songs stuck out for me too easy. And, um, um, security too easy mainly because too easy for me feels like the one the opposite side of the realm of the album the part of the album that's trying to like reconcile with the situation uh accept the situation which is his divorce the separation him having to deal with his kids there's a really good line i think true love or one of the other songs where he talks about having to like uh, you know, return his kids, like check them in, scan them like an item, like a library book. And you're like, that's a very interesting kind of like very visual, very kind of visceral way to kind of like represent that feeling, uh, I can imagine. 
And so too easy is kind of from that part of the album. The album kind of feels like it's sitting in these two different realms because one, it was, it was, I think it was executive produced by future or he was at least a big, you know, a big, you know, producer on it, uh, executive producer or whatever. Um, and so it's kind of like a trap album a little bit. There's a lot more rapping songs on it. Uh, definitely a chunk of chunk of the songs feel unfinished. I'm very surprised at the state of the Alicia Key songs because I thought a song, I mean, because I thought that song would have a little bit more kind of like shine and finish to it, honestly. But, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things where it, it is what it is. You know, you're just kind of sitting there like, oh, I just I just didn't think um, that that song out of all the songs would be the song that kind of sounded the roughest to me when I was listening to it. I, that song had a lot of clipping, a lot of peaking. And that's what I was surprised by, too, with this whole entire album is how much kind of clipping. I mean, that's kind of been his style since Pablo. Uh, I would say actually even his it's been his style since Jesus. Um, but man, the clipping on this album is crazy. Uh, and I really wanted to get the album as soon as possible, or at least like listen to it as soon as possible before he started changing stuff, just because the original uh, version of uh, the versions of security and the version of uh, too easy. I, I didn't know if he was going to change and clean those up. Those two songs sound really good. Raw. A lot of the other songs in the album kind of don't sound good. Raw. And then like the Migo song kind of sounds out of place on the album. It's definitely not his most cohesive album, though. I do. For some reason, just because of the few songs on there, and maybe it is also because of the X, uh, the XXX Tentacion samples, I, I kind of like the album a little bit more than Donda. I, I, in some ways, I will give people that the XXX Tentacion samples that he's thrown in there are, they're kind, they kind of work, kind of don't. They're kind of odd, but I don't know. I always like hearing, you know, I've always loved hearing X sing and especially, you know, like since it's not going to happen anymore, all these little bites that we get to hear in songs uh, is, is always, you know, welcome. And so that's great, but you know, I can give people a little bit on those songs why it's, it does kind of sound a little bit odd, but yeah, overall, you know, and like with security, like that song is very, it's very, in my opinion, striking. It kind of, I, a lot of people are like, oh man, it's so underproduced. Like he needs to add a lot more shit to it. I'm like, no, I kind of like, cause I remember when I heard it at the show, I liked how striking, how simplistic, how kind of like, you know, I don't know, straightforward it was. Cause it, it, you know, just the two sounds and they're very striking, very intense sounds. Right. And he kind of changes it up throughout the song. Um, it may, it makes me feel like instantly on edge. It feels, it, it kind of brought me back to, uh, and no spoilers, but there was in one of the episodes in the recent season of Euphoria, there was like a crazy, uh, fight that went on and that kind of, um, uh, imparted the same kind of feeling that I had when I was growing up and was around like very like intense fighting that was kind of like below the belt kind of stuff. And that's what I felt like the vibe that security very much like exposed was like, this is an unsettled situ, like unsettled, like fucked up, like really bad situation. But then the problem is, is like the song is literally about him, like getting in trouble with, well, it's supposedly about the, there was an incident that he had with Pete Davidson's um, security at Kim's house. That was his house. <clears throat> with his children and that whole entire thing. And you're like, it's almost kind of like a stalker anthem, which is not good. It's not good that somebody like Kanye has made a song that's basically a stalker anthem. But at the same time, like it very much like artistically evokes what he's trying to do. And I think he nails it. But it's one of those situations where it's like, do you <laughs> do you want to like listen to and I don't know, not that you have to agree with everything that you listen to per se when it comes to that stuff, but, or just when it comes to like art in general, but it's just, it's, it's a little unsettling. It's a little weird. And I don't know quite how to feel about it. Cause I really like the song when you just listen to it as a song. But then when you think, think about the context of the song, when you think about the situation, when you think about like, imagine, you know, God forbid, if something does happen to Pete Kim, or whoever is around them in the group because of some crazy shit Kanye will do. Now, maybe that would happen. Maybe I'm just being ridiculous and throwing a whole bunch of shit at a guy that has bipolar that needs to have a break. And that honestly, um, 
you know, just kind of needs to like move forward with it. Uh, and is just having like a rough time right now with it. Uh, and maybe it's all publicity stunt because he likes to do this shit a lot of the time around his albums is like spin up the publicity stunt shit crazy so that, you know, uh, there's a lot of eyeballs on his albums, which makes sense. But, you know, it's just it's just kind of one of those things where uh, and that's the whole thing with this album. I thought this album was going to have a redemptive arc and this album kind of has no arc, which makes me wonder if that's where Kanye's head is right now is like he doesn't really have an idea. Um, so, you know. I don't know. It it's 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 kind of one of those things. But I I gotta say I liked it more than Donda. We'll see where he goes with the rest of his music in the future, or just in general. We'll see what happens with the the stem player thing because it's such a weird, I don't know, experiment. And we'll see how that impacts Donda because I have a feeling that it's Donda is gonna have all these songs that people are gonna be like, what? <laughs> I don't what song? I don't who who what was that song? And you're like, oh, it was on Donda too. And they're gonna be like, oh yeah, I didn't listen to Donda too because I didn't want to pay two hundred dollars to listen to don do and especially with you know it's unfinished state like it's definitely not worth the two hundred dollars like if this was a life of pablo that he released on the stem player yes that could be worth two hundred dollars just because of how that was hitting at the time and the craziness of it and everything but uh it's not uh a pablo a life of pablo too so you know it just it is what it is it's kind of it's kind of how it's been with a lot of recent albums except for like Tyler the creator's album last year it's just been kind of a lot of like eh you know a little bit let downs a little bit this a little bit that and so you know we wonder i wonder you know with some of these big artists you know i look at like a lot of the big you know some of the big old school rockers and stuff like a lot of people look at metallica the same kind of way where it's just like they just don't quite have it like they used to i know my aunt always talks about this when it comes to nine inch nails she's like you know trent doesn't have it the way that he used to when he was in it and even though this is horrible to say it's like when people were when he was doing drugs when he was in the horribleness he was making way better music than he makes now at least you know and i agree and disagree with that to a certain degree i there is a kind of raw intensity that comes with music that is coming from somebody that is going through stuff but i also feel like uh, trent reznor is such a sort of force when it comes to just sound design music composition everything like he's he's literally like prince but of the uh industrial world and that uh and more because he's now you know i think award-winning uh composer you know film scorer you know so like you know be, you know to the moon and on so it's just so many more so much more dynamics than that but whatever anyways uh the last story which is going to kind of tie into the slept on uh, is Dua Lipa, Dua Lipa with the with the baby, but she's not with the baby because he's homophobic. But Dua Lipa is being sued for copyright infringement, um, for uh, levitating the song with the baby from a reggae band. Now I have listened to this song and it is it is uh, it is similar, though it is different enough. To where I get to a point where it's like, what are we going to, where, where are we going to draw the line here? Where are we going to be like, hey, you know, like, stop trying to get your payday with this, with these suits. Like, I understand people like stealing stuff. If this was actually like you were working with this person and they stole the song. But like in any other circumstance where it's like, oh, somebody heard the song. Like, unless they're like, unless it's like, in my opinion, like vanilla ice style, like sampled it horribly or whatever like or like i think Nicki minaj was trying to get uh tracy chapman to let her sample one of her songs and tracy chapman was like fuck you i don't know who you well i don't know if she said i don't know who you are but she was just like fuck you i don't want you sampling my song which is it's like fine but like when you're when you have like a ditty that sounds similar or like a part of the song kind of sounds similar but like there's enough elements in there where it's different or like yeah it sounds like a same song but like in a completely different genre or whatever i start to say like well there's only it's not that there's so much you could do with music, but there's certain lanes that we get into, especially with popular music. And you, when we do this stupid shit like suing people over things that sound the same, you just kind of start getting into territory where it's like, what, you know, what are we, are you so, okay, you released the song and yes, it is your copy. It is your copyright. It is your artistic expression, but don't we, isn't the whole entire point of music to share music? Aren't we trying to share shit with people? You know, aren't we trying to kind of like 
be open arm about it you know why do we have to be so kind of like you know and maybe these people this reggae band isn't being money grubby maybe they did work with her or one of her uh producers you know worked with them or heard the song before or whatever it was but it's just it gets hard and like there's been a lot of these stories because every single time this crops up i'm curious to listen especially after the uh um the what's his face the uh what the fuck was that song? It was the one that it was the guy, Robin Thicke with Pharrell, uh, the one that they, the Marvin Gaye's estate sued him. After that one, I've always been kind of like paying attention to these more and more and more just because I'm curious because that one to me didn't really sound like it at all. And it, it was very much like these two people were influenced by Marvin Gaye. So obviously the music is going to sound like that. Like, are you kidding me? That one kind of pissed me off. And there's been a couple, like, I think there was a Coldplay one that was stupid. And there's a couple others that I've listened to where I've been like, this song really doesn't actually sound that much like whatever you're claiming. Like, it's not really that simple. Like, I think oh, there, well, there was one, was it a Billie Eilish one? There's something like that where you're like, okay, come on. Uh, and it's supposedly gotten bad enough to where they tell artists that you don't even, you shouldn't even mention who you're inspired by anymore because there could be like it opens a door for people to come after you to possibly sue you because they're like, oh, uh, you are, I'm inspired by you. Fucking that song sounds exactly like my song. Like the uh, like an another one that was recently was the Olivia Rodrigo one, which is, you know, like I kind of understand that but at the same time I'm like come on it's just like an element that sounds similar she's not like she's not copying your fucking lyrics word for word you know uh <clears throat> it's just that kind of stuff always kind of you know kind of boggles me but now we are at you know the what I guess is now the period of the show the end of the show segment called slept on um she looks different. I, okay, so I'm just, I'm looking up. I, we'll start, we'll start, we'll start this. I slept on Dua Lipa. I slept on Dua Lipa for a while, okay? Um, I didn't, I don't think I didn't, I don't think I started listening to her till COVID. Honestly, if not like deep into COVID. It might have been deep into COVID. Um, and so I had slept on her for a while. I think I had heard one kiss, I think, at the club or just out and about. Um... But I hadn't heard about it. And I'm like, man, what a I it's like it's <clears throat> it really kind of boggles my mind uh that I didn't like hear about her more. Cause I'm like, again, I'm a big pop head, was a big old school, you know, Britney Spears, you know, Christian Aguilera, Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, you know, you name it. And even like modern pop stars, there's a lot of modern pop stars I love. You know, I'm a big, you know, Lady Gaga person. Like, let's talk, you know. And so I like a lot of, you know a lot of this realm and i'm always interested when new people crop up and seeing dua lipa kind of do it but then she's doing it in a very interesting her in a, in a style that's kind of her own um and you know but also like aping like i love the future nostalgia album like that this the retro futurism like angle that it was going for and kind of like sonically what she was kind of doing it uh what she was doing in that album kind of really uh you know kind of uh, it kind of really coalesced and I was kind of like, oh man, this album's like really cool. And I think I might have, I might have actually started listening to her right around when this album came out. I don't remember. I wasn't tracking the album or anything beforehand, but yeah. And it's, it's you know, just in like one of the songs I really like from her is not even one of her like more popular songs. So I think it's played a decent is pretty please. That song is such a good song it's so it's like it's such a vibe it's such a groove it's such a like a uh and it's such a simple song but it is very complex too um and i just that song was so good i love that song and the, you know like and again like i've also been following like ian kirkpatrick one of her uh one of the guys that produces for her every once in a while and he is just very a very interesting producer uh with what he does and kind of how he like imparts uh certain things and he's gonna just like the level of detail that he sometimes goes into kind of boggles my mind and so you know all those elements together it's just kind of like this like full package on top of the fact that she's just like you know drop dead gorgeous um and she gives me kind of like uh a fully f a more fully fleshed out like uh, charlie xcx because i feel like charlie xcx was fleshed out but she was also kind of you know almost kind of i feel like kind of like doja cat even though i'd argue doja cat's more recent album is more fleshed out they they're, they're kind of so eccentric that they kind of don't know how to kind of like focus that in a in a in a in a direction that makes sense brand wise whereas like dua lipa is like brand like i can give you 
I can give you a, a vision, you know, and that's what's always interesting from artists and bands and especially pop stars, because that's why I feel like, you know, pop stars like Prince, like Michael Jackson were as big as they were is because they gave you a vision with their music. You weren't just you weren't just listening to their album. You were getting an experience that kind of took you through. Um, and I feel like especially with uh, Future Nostalgia, she definitely kind of did that. Um, and even, like I said, sonically throughout the album, as you kind of like listen through, you're like, oh, you start getting hit by these different kind of like vibes. Uh, and I just I, I you know, she, I can't believe I slept on her as long as I did. Uh, I'm kicking myself for it. I can't wait. I don't know if she's doing more uh, albums. I know she said, now I'm, I'm reading through her, dis or her reading through the Wikipedia and, uh, it looks like she is doing like a movie or like a, she has some kind of film stuff. I don't know what that is exactly. Let me see. I saw it up here. Oh, go back again. What is this? Argyle or whatever is an upcoming spy film direct. Is she going to be in it? Oh, she's going to be in it. Oh, okay. So maybe she's doing a little bit of acting. Maybe she's like, I'm going to do a little bit of acting. I don't know. I haven't kept up for her, but I want to hear more music. I'm all about it. She's going to be slaying it, killing it. If she stays in it, you know, that's what it is, what it is. And I think she has a, what was she? she uh, oh, I remember. I, 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 I don't know. I, I spaced it. My brain is, boop. my brain is, uh, not where I, I slept wrong last night and my neck's been like fucking me up all day. So I've just been like, I've been zonked. But, uh, anyways, this is, uh, bottom fidelity. Um, I hope you had a good, uh, good time this week. Um, as always, you can email me at no clean music at gmail.com. It's no clean music, everything else. Um, Bottom Fidelity is also released on all streaming platforms. I'd imagine if you're hearing this, you already know. So, you know, but it's everywhere. So get it, you know, download it, tell your friends, send in questions to the email or just talk to me or ask me stuff or whatever. Um, get, we can get together, do whatever. Um, and yeah, you know, I think, yeah, it is what it is. So hope you guys have a good week. Uh, this was Bottom Fidelity.